Father, we pray that you'd give each one of us that comfort. Um, Each one of us has our own significant struggle in our life, difficulty, and we just pray that you would uh, give us that comfort, that that you're holding on to us in the midst of whatever trial we're in. And and Father, we pray that you would continue to strengthen us in that moment and and guide us as well. And, And that is why we keep coming back to your word. We come to your word every day in our daily lives because we need your strength and nourishment and guidance, but, but we gather together every Sunday as your body to hear you speak to us because we know we need your strength and your wisdom and your guidance in our lives. And so, Father, we pray that you would do that now here with us this morning, that, that you would speak clearly and powerfully to each one of us this morning, that all of these things going on in our hearts and our minds that could distract us from hearing what you have to say this morning, Father, calm them, push them off to the sides so that we could truly hear you speak clearly and powerfully to each one of us this morning. We pray that you would open our ears to hear, our eyes to see, and our hearts to receive what you have to say to us this morning. And all God's people said, amen. Amen. So to, this morning's sermon is another kind of brief recap, kind of laying groundwork. You know, we've, we've broken this series on sexuality up into three sections. We have the created section that talks about all the created realities, and then the broken section that we're in right now, which is not so much fun, but it's showing how sin has kind of caused issues with all of this. And then the final section we're going to be going into is Uh, redeemed and how God redeems everything that has been broken in different ways. And so, um, but we're in the broken section right now. And so I want to, I'm going to, today's going to, I'm going to recap about three sermons worth of material to kind of get us on the path for the next few weeks. And so um, a lot of ground to cover again. And like I've encouraged you, if you want to dive deeper, use those study booklets or go back and read my old sermons on this. They're all, they're all available online. Um, But we're looking at Genesis chapter 3, because this is where all of the mess started. (laughs) Uh, It's often called the fall, and so we'll read the first 16 verses of Genesis 3. I don't think my clicker's working, Char. There it goes. Now the serpent was more crafty than any of the wild animals the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, Did God really say you must not eat from any tree in the garden? The woman said to the serpent, We may eat fruit from the trees, I don't know, maybe the battery is dying, in the garden, but God did say you must not eat from the tree that is in the middle of the garden, and you must not touch it or you will die. You will not surely die, the serpent said to the woman. God knows that when you eat from it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. When the woman saw that the fruit of the tree was good for food and pleasing to the eye and also desirable for gaining wisdom, she took some and ate it. She also gave some to her husband who was with her, and he ate it. Then the eyes of both of them were opened, and they realized they were naked. So they sewed fig leaves together and made coverings for themselves. Then the man and his wife heard the sound of the Lord God as he was walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And they hid from the Lord God among the trees of the garden. But the Lord God called to the man, Where are you? He answered, I heard you in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked, so I hid. And he said, Who told you you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree that I commanded you not to eat from? The man said, The woman you put here with me, she gave me some of the fruit from the tree, and I ate it. Then the Lord said to the woman, What is this you have done? The woman said, The serpent, he deceived me, and I ate. So the Lord God said to the serpent, Because you have done this, cursed are you above all livestock and all wild animals. You will crawl on your belly and you will eat dust all the days of your life. And I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and hers. He will crush your head and you will strike his heel. To the woman, he said, I will greatly increase your pains in childbearing. With pain, you will give birth to children. Your desire will be for your husband, and he will rule over you. 
So, so last week, we kind of spent a lot of time working, kind of looking at these creational realities, right? How did God create things to function? And, and it's always important to start there with pretty much anything, but, but especially when we're talking about sexuality, because we begin with the way that God has designed things to work, right? When God created the world, he created humanity, he looked at it and he said, this is very good. And so we, we always have to use that as this guideline because that's how God created things to work. And so, and connected with that is when, when you live according to the ways that God has designed everything to work, you're, you're actually living in accordance with reality, right? And if you try to separate yourself from, if you try to kind of live and act in a way that's disconnected from the way God has designed things or disconnected from reality, then things don't work well. And uh, I, got, I got an example of this. It was actually pretty funny because I used to use this analogy all the time, and I wasn't sure how helpful it was. And then it actually happened at this last winter retreat with the youth group. And so I was teaching on these things with the kids in, in, uh, at the winter retreat, talking about creational realities and having to live according to that. And at some point during the week, and I don't even remember when it was, but a kid said, hey, can I borrow a pen? And I said, sure. So I always have a pen in my pocket. So I pulled it out, gave it to them, went back to my conversation. And a couple minutes later, they came back kind of with a goofy look on their face and gave me a pen in like two or three pieces. <laughs> and I was like, what did you do? And they kind of looked down and they said, I tried to play the drums with it. <laughs> and I said, well, how did that work out for you? <laughs> well, not well. The pen broke into pieces. Why? Because the pen was not designed to be used as a drumstick. <laughs> and he's lucky he didn't break the drums with it. And so when you, when you use something for something it was never designed to be used for, it breaks or damage is caused. And that, that happens to actually every part of our life, um, but also it happens with, with our sexuality as well. And so... So we take that and we look at, all right, here's how God has designed us, right? Well, last week we talked about at least kind of the three main things we need to keep in mind. God designed us body and soul, right? And we can't try to disconnect our body from our soul. We don't want to emphasize the body or the soul over one another. We want to hold them in tension, right? God created us to be in relationship with him, with him and with other people. And we need to make sure those are in the right places, right? We, God's the fundamental relationship and other people are under that. But we got to keep those. And then God gave us good desires. And so desires aren't a bad thing. They're only bad when they're desiring the wrong things, right? And so today I get the really fun opportunity to show you how sin has broken every one of those things. It's broken our bodies and our souls. It's broken our relationship with God and with other people. And it's broken our desires. Like literally everything has been messed up because of sin in the world. Sin has actually gone out and infected, we talked about this a few weeks ago, it's actually infected every aspect of creation. Um, when God talks to Adam after, after the sin, he said, even the ground is cursed because of you. And so sin has messed everything up. And, but it's important for us to realize that sin, sin messes things up in a kind of a unique way. Um, I always say, like, sin doesn't come into your life like a Disney villain, where, like, in a, you watch a Disney show, and the villain comes into the scene, and you're like, that's the bad guy. We know it. They're, they're like, dark and brooding, and, and you just know right away they're the bad guy. Um, that's not really how sin works. Uh, it's not so easily pointed at in, in our lives. That often, the main way that sin works is it actually comes into your life and takes a good thing and turns it into a bad thing. Uh, and that's quite often. Sometimes it's kind of just by amplifying that thing beyond the way God designed it. And so I want to give you one, one example of that. Um, last week I mentioned how God created food, and he created it good for the eyes. It looks pleasing to us, and it's good to taste, right? It's good to eat. And he did that because he wants us to desire food, right? Right? Um, but what happens is now sin comes in and takes that desire, that good desire for good food, and, uh, and he starts to kind of distort it. And, and he can make it so that we start desiring food in 
ways that it was never designed to be desired. Or, and so we'll, we'll desire food sometimes just to, because we're bored. And so maybe this will be a cure for our boredom. I'll eat something. Well, food wasn't designed to, to cure your boredom. And so guess what? It's not going to fix it. Right? Or you, know, you have the, the movie where somebody's sad and they eat a whole tub of ice cream trying to like, drown their sorrows in food. Well, guess what? Food was not designed to drown your sorrows, and so it won't do it. And so you can keep eating and eating and eating and eating and eating, trying to drown your sorrows, and guess what? It's not going to do it, right? You can be bored. You keep eating and eating and eating, and you, guess what? You're still going to be bored. And so what happens is God takes, or not God, sin takes that good desire and twists it and distorts it. And so this good desire turns into this kind of spiral of us trying to use things for things they were not created to be used for, and they don't fill it, and we just try to do it more and more and more and more, and it turns into something that's bad. And that's really the essence of sin at, at its core, underneath everything. That's how sin Works and that's kind of corrupting everything, every part of our existence. And so, as we as we kind of dive into how sins that sin in that way is corrupting our physical existence, we we see right away in the Bible right away how sin affects our our bodies. Right when when God talks to Adam, this is just not working today. In the garden, he tells Adam this. He says. You shall not surely eat of the tree from the, of the tree. You can, you may surely eat of every tree of the garden, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat. For in the day that you eat of it, you will surely die. And and I think we need to pay attention to that last that last part. Right on the day you eat of it, you will surely die. Now a lot of people have wondered about that, and they said, but they didn't. <laughs> they ate from the tree, and they were still alive that day. So what, is God lying, or what's going on there? And, and, and a number of people have said, well, what happened, and I'm not saying this is wrong, what happened was they, they spiritually died in that moment. And, and there's a point where that's true. There, there was this kind of mess in their spirit where, where they're separated from God, and we'll, we'll talk about that in a little bit. So there is kind of a spiritual death that happened in that moment, but I think there's more. Um, I think this is one of the first instances where we see God show mercy. Um, they were, he didn't, they didn't die in that moment. They deserved to die because God said, when you eat of this, you're going to die. And they ate of it, and God said, I'm going to show you mercy. But guess what? They will still eventually die. There's still going to be consequences to their actions. And, uh, and you read through Genesis, this is the most common phrase you will read in the book of Genesis. And he died. We, we don't notice it because we skim over it because it's in the genealogies. But you get through and they go through a genealogy. So-and-so had these kids and then he died. And then so-and-so had these kids and he died. And so-and-so had, and it goes like 30 times in a row. It'll say, he died, he died, he died, he died. And it's a reminder that's because of sin. People die. And, and it keeps happening over and over and, and over again, which is why Romans says the wages of sin is death. And so that's how sin works. And so that's one just obvious impact on our kind of physical reality, right? Like sin has caused so that our bodies break down and, and die. Um, but there's more that, that goes on. One of the, one of the interesting things is when, when God's talking to Adam and Eve after their sin, he says this. He says to the woman, he said, I will surely multiply your pain in childbearing. And then to Adam, he said, cursed is the ground because of you. In pain, you will eat of it all the days of your life. Thorns and thistles it will bring up for you, and you shall eat the plants of the field by the sweat of your face you will eat bread till you return to the ground, and for out of it you are taken, for you are dust, and to dust you will return. And here's one of the powerful things to recognize. What were the two things that God told Adam and Eve were their, their duty in the world? Be fruitful and multiply, and, and work the ground and keep it. 
And he said, these, these aspects of your life now are going to be filled with pain. You're going to have children painfully, right? You're, you're going to work and you're going to have pain, right? I was just showing Jerry. I was working on my house. I've got blisters all over my hands yesterday. And I was thinking, because of sin, <laughs> you know, there, there's pain in the world because of sin. And that's affecting our physical bodies. And, and if you think about it, pain is like a small form of death every time, right? It's, it's just like this minor thing, and they just kind of lead up, lead up, lead up, till eventually we die. And so the, the reminder for us is, is that, and we know this, sin affects our bodies in a lot of ways. Our bodies right now aren't functioning perfectly the way that God designed them to function, right? They, they break down, as many of you know. Right? And as we pray for each week, all of the different surgeries and the pains that people are in, that's because our bodies start to break down and our, our muscles get tight and sore because it's so darn cold and windy all the time. And we break bones, our digestive systems don't work, our hormones can get all out of whack. And, and all of that's because sin has come in and messed with our bodies. And, and they just don't work the way that, that they're supposed to work. And so it's messed with our bodies and it's messed with our souls and then it messes with our relationships. And we see that right away in the garden as well. Um, look at how they respond to God. They hear the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day and the man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. And so we've been created on the one hand to be in this fundamental relationship with God and yet, right as soon as sin enters the world, what happens? That relationship is broken. They, they start hiding themselves from God because there's this separation there between them. And so, that's, so we see that broken. But then we also see, as soon as sin enters the world, that their relationships with other people are broken, right? And one of the really just clear examples comes in Genesis 4, where Cain kills Abel. Like, we're brother, brother. Why does Cain kill Abel? Because he's mad at how God treated him. And so then he, he kills his brother, and we see, okay, brothers are fighting and, and now killing one another because our relationships with other people are messed up. But we also see this in, in this, it, God says that because of sin, there's going to be this relational tension between Adam and Eve. He says to Eve, he says, your desire will be contrary to your husband, and he will rule over you. And uh, there's, I'm not going to get into it because I don't have all the time to explain it, but this isn't, what this is saying is that the male-female relationship is going to be a mess, <laughs> right? It's going to be a mess. There's going to be this constant, um, I, I, I've talked to people who've actually described marriage as, it's all about power, non-Christians. It's just each, the husband and wife, they're just working to get themselves in a position of power over the other one. That, that's what marriage is. And I'm like, that's not how it was designed to function. That's because of sin. But we know that. Like, we're just kind of trying to kind of get our way, and that's because of sin. And so this fundamental relationship that God has given us between husband and wives, where we're one flesh, that even has tension built into it because of sin. And so all of these relationships are messed up. And so sin has messed up our bodies and our souls. It's messed up our relationship with God and with others. And then the final one is it's messed up our desires. And pun intended, this is the heart of the matter. Um, really at the core, all, all sin is about wrong desire. And it's really important for us to get that, that, that all of the sinful actions we see out there are just are symptoms of, of sinful desires. And we get a little glimpse of this. I don't want to take this too far, but we get a little glimpse of this in the garden when Eve eats the fruit, the forbidden fruit. Because um, remember, what, how did God create the trees? Pleasant to the eyes and, and good for food, Right? Now look at what Eve desires from the tree. The woman saw the tree was good for food, it was a delight to the eyes, that's how God designed it, and that the tree was to be desired to make one wise. She took of its fruit and ate, and she also gave some to her husband who was with her, and he ate. 
And like I said, I don't want to make too much of that, but notice there's a clear, like, she's desiring more from this tree than, than God designed it for. He designed it to be good for food, pleasant to the eyes, and she's saying, but is there more that I can get out of this? And that's sin. And that's really, again, like I mentioned at the beginning, the root of all sin is us desiring things beyond what God has designed them to be desired for. And that's really what, what lust is. Uh, so we, we talk about, well, usually when we talk about lust, we think kind of in the, in the, around the realm of like sexual desires, but, but the Bible actually talks about lust as being um, beyond that, just desiring something beyond what God designed it to be desired for, or lust being uh, disordered desires, you'll hear me say sometimes. And so, yes, you, you can lust after a, a man or a woman sexually, but you can also lust after money and power, and food, and beauty, and relationships. You can lust after all of them. And, uh, but notice how that connects with what I said at the beginning of the sermon. Sin takes a good thing and turns it into a bad thing, right? And so money, and sex, and relationships, and, and power even, and, and food, they're all good things, aren't they? They're things that we're to desire. And yet, what happens is a sin comes in and turns those good things and those good desires into something that ends up being bad. And actually what, what the, the Bible says is that they become idolatrous. Um, they become gods in their own way. And I heard, I heard one pastor say, like, really basically, if you want to understand idolatry is a good thing that turns into a God thing that becomes a bad thing. Right, And so that's what idolatry is. Good things that, that we end up desiring beyond what they should be desired for, and they turn into a god or an idol. And so when we desire money in ways that are beyond what it was to be desired for, it becomes a god. It becomes an idol, and, and it destroys us. The same thing with food or, or power or whatever, or beauty or even relationships. They can become idols that will destroy us, um, which is why the Bible connects lust and coveting and idolatry. They're, they're all connected. Um, look at this verse in Colossians. It says, put to death, therefore, what is sinful or earthly in you, sexual immorality, impurity, passion, evil desire, and covetousness, which is idolatry. And so it makes the direct connection of coveting being idolatry, right? And, and on a real basic level, I think we've all understood coveting being, well, desiring something that you don't have, right? But it's more than that. It's this disordered desires. That's why you see evil desire and passion, but it's like not, there can be good passion and bad passion. Let's talk about bad passion. And so all of these desires, sexual stuff and evil desires and coveting, it says it's all at the core, it's all idolatry. And, and when we go through Scripture, what we realize is that idolatry is not just, not just a slap in the face to God, which it, it is, but it's also extremely destructive. And so I, I think we, I don't know, I, there's something in us that has this tendency to think, well, idolatry is just not that bad. Um, it's not that big of a deal, but um, listen to this passage from Psalm 135 as it describes um, idolatry. It says, The idols of the nations are silver and gold, the work of human hands. They have mouths but do not speak. They have eyes but do not see. They have ears but do not hear, nor is there any breath in their mouths. And then it says, Those who make them become like them, and so do all who trust in them. And the principle underneath all of this is you become like what you worship. And so it says idols, they can't speak, they can't hear, they can't see, they can't breathe. What does that mean? They're dead. And it says those who make them and those who trust in them, they die. You, 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 don't, you, you lose your ability to speak, to hear, to breathe. Because you die. And so there's this, there's this 
idea that when, when we worship idols, when we, when we um, yeah, begin to worship idols, we slowly lose our ability, like we slowly become, and it's going to sound strong, but hear me out, we slowly become less human and, and more like the idols that we're worship, worshiping. And then eventually we die because the wages of sin is, is death. And, and I heard one really powerful example uh, this past week. Um, it's a quote from a guy named Archibald Hart. Uh, and I think he shows like how even non-Christians are, are beginning to recognize this. He says, talking about our current culture, we have taken the pursuit of pleasure too far. And in so doing, we've lost the ability to experience the very pleasure we are pursuing. Consistent overuse of the brain's pleasure circuits causes us to lose our capacity to experience pleasure. You become what you worship. And another way to say that is if you're going to continue to worship idols that can feel no pleasure, guess what will happen? You will lose your ability to feel pleasure. Scientifically, your brain starts freaking out, but just at the core, you're becoming like what you worship. You become less, less human. And, and you kind of just keep going down this path of death and destruction. Um, and I mentioned this last time that um, you know, anybody out here who's, who's ever struggled with some form of addiction knows what this feels like because this is like the real a strong example of addiction, right? You, you start using some substance to try to experience pleasure and you get some pleasure out of it. But then your brain stops feeling pleasure from that thing. And so you need either more of that thing or you need a stronger version of that thing to give you pleasure. And then, you, and then that doesn't do good enough. So you need more and you need more and you need more and you need more and you need more. And you enter this whole spiral. And all the while, you're losing your ability to even experience pleasure. And so you're becoming more and more like the idol that you're chasing. And, and you're becoming less and less human. It's, it's tragic. And, and I want to be clear because that's not just true of addicts. Like, we can look at addicts and we can say, like, yeah, look at that. But, but I can tell you from years of experience, I have seen people do the same thing with relationships. Where they look at relation, and not, I'm not even just talking about boyfriend, girlfriend relationships, I'm, or husband, whatever, sexual relationships. I'm talking about just relationships where they go through life saying, I need this person to fill this need in my life. And then they don't fill that need, so then I need this person to fill that need in my life, and I need this person to fill that need in my life. And they are just an addict of relationships, spiraling down, trying to use people to meet their needs. And those people were never designed to meet those needs in their life. And so you just kind of start on that, that same death spiral. I see people do it with food. I see people do it with work. I see people do it with money. We start trying to use these things to meet needs they were never designed to meet. And you start down on the spiral. And, uh, and you start becoming more and more like the idol that you're chasing and less and less like the human that you've been created to be. And, and when we talk like this, it sounds really extreme, doesn't it? Um, because we don't like to think like this. But I always say we have to acknowledge reality. <laughs> and we can't pretend like these things are not that bad and they don't cause that much damage. Or that idolatry is not a big deal or our kind of messed up desires are not a big deal. Uh, the reality is they are destroying you. Um, slowly eating you away from the inside out, um, slowly transforming you into the unhuman idol that, that you're chasing. Um, and, and we need to get that reality deep down in our soul, that that's really what's happening. Which is why the gospel is such a powerful reality. Um, because any of you who've experienced addiction, like really, like clearly experienced that, any of the rest of us have experienced it in our own ways, like, you know the hopelessness of feeling stuck. Like, I'm in this spiral, and I just can't get out, and I just don't know how to get out. That's a hopeless feeling, and that's actually the reality of everyone apart from 
Christ. Or then, and you get in that spiral and shame and guilt piles up on you and then bad habit after bad habit, destructive habit, they all keep piling up and you feel like you're being crushed by them. And then the gospel comes in and says, well, if you look to Christ in faith, you can be set free from all of that. Be set free from all of those addictions. You can be set free from all of the foolish idol chasing you've done. You can be set free from all of your destructive pursuits. You don't have to be there anymore. You're forgiven from them. You're forgiven of all of the stupid mistakes, the stupid desires, the stupid idols that you chase. They're all forgiven. But as I keep reminding us, we're, we're more than just forgiven. That's the beauty of the gospel. We're, we're forgiven of all of those, but now we're being redeemed and restored and renewed and being, we're told we're being transformed back into the image of God that's been all beat up and distorted by sin, which is Jesus Christ. We're becoming more and more like Christ, which means we're actually being restored more in to become who God created us to be. And, and so... He's actually making us more fully human is what this process is. And which is why I always say we can never, as Christians, we can never be satisfied with living the, the just forgiven life. Like, well, I'm forgiven and so I'm going to go out and I'm going to do whatever I want to do because I'm forgiven. And I always, I mean, not, well, I'll be blunt. That's foolishness. That's ridiculous. Like, why would you ever do that? Like, who in the world would choose to live a life that is less than human? But that's what we're doing when we're going down these paths of, of idolatry. We're choosing to live a life that's less than human. Why? Who would want to live a life of death and destruction? Why would you do that and say, well, at least I'm forgiven? It's crazy. Rather, we could say, I'm forgiven and we can rejoice in that, but then even more so, we can rejoice in the fact that Christ is redeeming our desires so that we actually start to desire the right things in the right places at the right times. We can, we can, we can rejoice in the fact that God's redeeming our relationship with Him. He's renewing that, redeeming our relationship with all those people around us, that He's actually restoring our bodies and our souls in, in unique ways. We can rejoice in all of that, and then we can strive in the power of the Holy Spirit and through Christ, not in our own strength, but we can strive to then start to live out the life that we've been created to live, the life we've been called to live, and that life that Christ is renewing and restoring in us. And that is the beautiful power of the gospel. Let's come to God in prayer. Heavenly Father, we just come to you and thank you uh, we thank you that you've done more than just forgive us. We thank you, oh Lord, we thank you for your forgiveness and, and the freedom of that forgiveness. But we thank you that, that you've promised to come in and restore us and renew us and redeem us and, and shape us to become more and more like your son, Jesus Christ. And Father, we also come thanking you for that, but we also come confessing that we fall so, so short of that reality. We often are messed up in our relationship with you, messed up in our relationship with other people. Our desires are all over the place. And so we, we confess that to you, Lord. And uh, we're thankful for your forgiveness. We rest in that, but we have hope because you've promised to renew those desires and renew those relationships. And so, Father, we pray that you would Renew and restore us through the power of your Holy Spirit, that you continue to work in our lives, restoring the relationship, our relationship with you, restoring our relationship with others, and then reordering the desires of our heart so that we desire the right things in the right places at the right times. And so continue that process, Lord, but help us to, to live that out with joy and peace, knowing that you are our God and you will never let us go. And all God's people said, Amen.